This morning I want to talk about um, the progress of the gospel and uh, really what I'm kind of hoping to do is to begin a series of lessons, not very long, on the book of Philippians. So if you would open your Bibles and turn to the book of Philippians chapter 1, that is where we will be this morning as we talk about this theme of the progress of the gospel, um, which is really, I believe, the whole point of this section that we're going to read and really the point of the whole letter but also something that we as Christians fundamentally need to be concerned with. This is something that's very, very basic for us as believers. And if we lose sight of our goal as the, of the progress of the gospel, I dare say we're going to lose sight of a lot of the things that Christianity is really about. Um, but this is something that Paul emphasizes twice in this chapter. In Philippians chapter 1 and verse 12, he wants to let them know. He says, I want you to know, brethren, that my circumstances have turned out for the greater progress of the gospel. And again, in verse 25, he, tells, he makes the point, convinced of this, I know that I will remain and continue with you all for your progress and joy in the faith, so that your proud confidence in me may abound in Christ Jesus through my coming to you again. Now, and really, if you want to boil down what this letter is about in a nutshell, it's about how, basically, the progress of the gospel is what's going on right now, and it's what needs to continue in each and every one of your lives personally. I'm, I'm not going to... I'm not going to spend a lot of time talking about introductory elements. Paul writes this letter from prison to a church in Philippi. Um, and primarily it seems to be directed at this, um, at least in response in some part to some support that he had received from them. So what we have is a very lengthy thank you letter. Although one that drives home a powerful point at the same time. Which is that you know, we need to be concerned with how the gospel is advancing in every walk of life. I want to begin really just by reading the chapter. Beginning in verse 1, Paul and Timothy, bond servants of Christ Jesus, to all the saints in Christ Jesus who are in Philippi, including the overseers and the deacons, grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. I thank my God in all my remembrance of you, always offering prayer with joy in my every prayer for you all, in view of your participation in the gospel from the first day until now. For I am confident of this very thing, that he who began a good work in you will perfect it until the day of Christ Jesus. For it is, not, for it is only right for me to feel this way about you all, because I have you in my heart. Since both in my imprisonment and in the defense and confirmation of the gospel, you are all partakers of grace with me. For God is my witness, how I long for you with all the affection of Christ Jesus. And this I pray, that your love may abound still more and more in real knowledge and all discernment, so that you may approve the things that are excellent, in order to be sincere and blameless until the day of Christ having been filled with the fruit of righteousness, which comes through Jesus Christ to the glory and praise of God. Now I want you to know, brethren, that my circumstances have turned out for the greater progress of the gospel, so that my imprisonment in the cause of Christ has become well known throughout the whole Praetorian Guard and to everyone else, and that most of the brethren trusting in the Lord because of my imprisonment have far more courage to speak the word of the Lord without Fear. Some, to be sure, are preaching Christ, even from envy and strife, but some also from goodwill. The latter do it out of love, knowing that I am appointed for the defense of the gospel. The former proclaim Christ out of selfless am self selfish ambition, rather than from pure motives, thinking to cause me distress in my imprisonment. What then? Only that in every way, whether in pretense or in truth, Christ is proclaimed, and in this I will rejoice. Yes, and I will rejoice, for I know that this will turn out for my deliverance through your prayers and the provision of the Spirit of Jesus Christ, according to my earnest expectation and hope, that I will not be put to shame in anything, but that with all boldness Christ will even now, as always, be exalted in my body, whether by life or by death. For to me, to live is Christ, to die is gain. 
But if I am to live on in flesh, this will mean fruitful labor for me, and I do not know which to choose. But I am hard-pressed from both directions, having the desire to depart and be with Christ, for that is very much better. Yet to remain on in the flesh is more necessary for your sake. Convinced of this, I know that I will remain and continue with you all for your progress and joy in the faith, so that your proud confidence in me may abound in Christ Jesus through my coming to you again. Only conduct yourselves in a manner worthy of the gospel of Christ, so that whether I come and see you or remain absent, I will hear of you that you are standing firm in one spirit with one mind, striving together for the faith of the gospel. In no way alarmed by your opponents, which is a sign of destruction for them, but of salvation for you. That too, from God. For you it has been granted for Christ's sake, not only to believe in him, but also to suffer for his sake, experiencing the same conflict which you saw in me, and now here to be in me. Let's talk about these uh, pieces one at a time. And, of course, we won't be able to talk about everything this morning in the short space of time we have, but we'll hit a few points. The, the letter opens, of course, in the standard way that most letters do. Paul starts out by greeting them. Uh, both Paul and Timothy are involved in the writing of this letter, although Paul appears to be the main speaker throughout since he frequently says, I, instead of we. Both of them are slaves of Christ. This is written to all the saints who are in the Lord Christ, and uh, they're, they're granted peace from the Lord Jesus Christ. Includes the overseers and deacons of the Philippian congregation. Um, and then there's this, what we have, what follows is kind of a section on thanksgiving and prayer. So in verses 3 through 8, Paul says, I thank. And, uh, you know, a lot of people read these Thanksgiving sections and they kind of gloss over it and say, well, he's just giving thanks for them. But there's always, you know, almost always when Paul does this, he throws in these key words that are going to be important in this letter. And they're going to be important to this theme of the progress of the gospel. It's easy to skip over it and gloss over what it has to say, but don't forget to look and pay attention. You'll get clues as to what the rest of the letter is going to be about. And so Paul employs numerous key words, uh, which include all these references. We're not going to look at all of them, obviously. But you know, he talks about joy in verse 4. He talks about this idea of fellowship or participation or sharing in verses 5 and 7. He talks about the gospel, which, as I've noted before, the progress of the gospel is really important in this letter. Uh, and he talks about this idea of feeling or thinking, having a mind in oneself. Uh, which is uh, not such a not a very common verb, but it appears a ten, ten times in this short little letter. In verse seven, it is only right for me to feel this way or to think this way about you all. Well, it's the same term used in chapter two and verse two when he tells them to uh, think alike or be of the same mind. And uh, in verse in verse five, where he says, "Have this mind in yourselves, which is also in Christ Jesus." You know, because, I mean, that's really what it's about, ultimately, is the progress of the gospel is first and foremost about transforming our thinking. Transforming our, the way we think about our interactions with others, about other people in general. Trying to transform that thinking so that it is conformed with the way Jesus thinks. That's what Paul's trying to do. That's what he calls on us to do as well. And of course, I mean, you look at some of these terms, though. Joy. Joy seems out of place, doesn't it? This guy is in prison when he's writing this letter. Uh, a man that is under the lock and key of the Roman guard starts talking about his joy that he has when he prays for the Philippians. I tell you, you know, I mean, I can get bummed out by various, you know, everyday happenings here and there. You know, I can get bummed out by discovering that we're out of Oreo cookies or something like that. But Paul's in prison, and yet he's not bummed out. He has joy in himself. Why does he have joy? Well, because, number one, of their participation in the gospel, verse 5. Because of his confidence that they will follow through, verse 6. Because of the fact that they partake of his grace, even while he's in prison, verse 7. He's joyful about these things because they all point towards the same thing. The progress of the gospel. And what about fellowship? You know, I mean, fellowship is kind of a strange thing to talk about uh, when you're in jail too. 
I mean, you know, you get a letter from prison and you, I mean, if I, if I knew somebody who was in prison and they wrote me a letter and say, boy, I'm so glad you're sharing with me in this imprisonment that I'm in. I'm not in jail. What, 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 why are we talking about that? But that's what fellowship is. That's, it's a sharing. It's a mutual participation in something. And in this case, the Philippians are participating in Paul's preaching of the gospel by sending him support. We get that later on in chapter 4. But they're sharing. It's so much more than something monetary. It's so much more than simply writing a check and forgetting about it. They share in the progress of the gospel by conforming themselves to Christ, by being obedient to Christ. And they have something in common with a man in prison. That's their love for Christ. And after Paul thanks God for all these things, we have in verses 9 through 11, I pray. Sometimes Paul writes letters to address false teaching, like in Galatians. Sometimes he writes letters to address congregational controversies, like 1 Corinthians. But Paul writes to the Philippians basically just to write a big thank you letter. Uh, and, I mean, you know, you got a couple things he mentions here and there. Beware the dogs and the false circumcision. Uh, talking about their opponents here and there. At one point he calls out two ladies in the congregation by name and tells them to stop bickering in chapter 4. Got to love that he put that in the letter. But by and large, this letter is, it demonstrates the idea that Paul's mostly pleased with the way this congregation is acting. He seems to be very happy about the Philippian congregation. And Paul's very thankful for their joy, for their participation in the gospel, you know, for the mindset that they have that tries to conform itself to Christ. So what does Paul pray for? More of that. More of, I don't know why I wrote more of the that up there, but more of that. More of the same. He prays for their love to abound more and more. Verse 9. He prays for them to have real knowledge. He prays for them to approve the things that are excellent. The things that make a difference. The things that matter. Things that have greater value. It's like an inspector testing gold to see whether it's good or not. They need to test everything they come into contact with and see, is this excellent? Is this something that has intrinsic value? He prays that they would approve that in verse 10. He prays that they will be sincere and blameless until the day. Why is, this, why is progress of the gospel so important? Is it just being good for goodness sake? Just, you know, there's some inherent satisfaction from being a good person with no reward? Well, no. Paul's focus is on the end goal. The progress of the gospel means that we're moving towards something. We're moving towards the day. The day of Christ Jesus. The day when He returns. The day when we receive resurrection. And He calls on them to be filled with the fruit of righteousness which comes through Jesus Christ to the glory and praise of God. That's what the progress of the gospel is about. Paul thanks God that the Philippians participate so much in the gospel and he prays that they'll do it even more because nobody's perfect. No congregation has really fully arrived. There's always some room for improvement. There's always some room for progress. In verses 12 through 16, Paul talks about the progress that he has uh, while he is in prison. I want you to know, brethren, that my circumstances have turned out for the greater progress of the gospel so that my imprisonment in the cause of Christ has become well known throughout the whole Praetorian Guard and to everyone else and that most of the brethren, trusting in the Lord because of my imprisonment, have far more courage to speak the word of God without fear. That's how Paul's imprisonment has affected the gospel. Paul wants the Philippians to know that regardless of how bad it is, regardless of how bleak the situation may be, since, you know, he's in jail, his situation's turned out for the greater good, ultimately. Most people think, you know, most people think being in jail is bad. But Paul managed to figure out something good in it. And it wasn't some petty little uh, pep talk that he gave himself. Paul saw a way in which his imprisonment was quantitatively influencing the progress of the gospel. It was actually making things better. How? Well, first of all, verse 13, Paul's time in prison 
specifically caused everyone in the praetorium to know about the cause of Christ. What is the praetorium? You know, the praetorium was a place where the government conducted official business. Uh, you know, we might compare it today to a city hall, although uh, there were soldiers in it as well. Uh, some people, and the New American Standard reflects this translation, that the praetorian guard is uh, just the soldiers that are stationed there, which uh, would have, in Rome, that would have been 9,000 troops. But Paul could just be more simply saying that everyone... Uh, who works at the Praetorium has heard about this, in which case it would be a larger number. But in either case, in either case, the point is that Paul has made himself and the Gospel known in the Praetorium to a lot of people. That's progress. Now whether or not they're converted, you don't know. That may not, that's not the most relevant point actually. They've all heard the message. And because they've heard the message, that's considered progress of the gospel. And if people were actually to convert to Christ on account of hearing the message, so much the better. That's just the icing on the sweet cake. But even if they don't convert, the fact that Christ has been proclaimed in the halls of the Roman emperor, in the seat of the Roman government, that's progress. That's a win for the gospel such a central proclaiming of the gospel within the Roman prisons has another side effect too though. Look at verse 14. Other people are now being emboldened to speak out. That's the progress of the gospel right there. Because of Paul's imprisonment, all of his other brethren, you know, they may not even be in prison, they hear about him, they hear about what he's going through, and they are able, because of that, to find the courage within themselves to speak out themselves. To speak the word of God without fear. And when other people start proclaiming the gospel, that means even more people are hearing it outside the prison. That's a win for the gospel too. May God embolden us. Speak the word without fear. Paul's imprisonment. This, is not, this isn't just about Paul finding the good in a bad situation. This is Paul using the bad situation to change things for the better. To make things work out for the progress of the gospel. To make real progress. You know. Of course, there's another side to this. In verse 15, it talks about those who are preaching Christ from envy and strife and some from good... Now, and some are preaching from goodwill, but the latter are doing it... And the latter are doing it out of love, but the former proclaim Christ, verse 17, out of selfish ambition rather than from pure motives thinking to cause me distress in my imprisonment. Paul has opponents, and his imprisonment has affected the opponents, too. There are some people who are preaching Christ for the wrong reasons. Verse 15. Some people are preaching from goodwill, yes, but some people are preaching from envy and strife. Gospel preachers, imagine that. You know, gospel preachers are fully capable of having corrupt and wicked motives. They exist. And if you live long enough, you'll meet them. We've got two groups of people here. You have those who are preaching from envy and strife. And you have those who are preaching from goodwill. You have those who are preaching from selfish ambition. And you have those who are preaching out of love. You have those who are wanting to distress Paul in his imprisonment. And you have those who are working out of pure motives. You have those who are preaching from pretense. And you have those who are preaching from truth. And you know what Paul has to say to those bad preachers who are speaking such, with such evil motives in his imprisonment? I'm not going to let it bother me. That's what he's got to say about it. Paul doesn't let it bother him. Why? Because even if they're preaching from pretense or from truth, whichever one it is, they're still proclaiming Christ. And it's similar in the, gospel, in the Gospel of Luke, in Luke chapter 9. Uh, Jesus' disciples, they bring a complaint to Jesus. Uh, John said, Master, uh, Luke 9, verses 49 and 50. John answered and said, Master, we saw someone casting out demons in your name. And we tried to prevent him because he does not follow along with us. But Jesus said to him, Do not hinder him, for he who is not against you is for you. Someone's been casting out demons in the name of Jesus. 
Oh, but he's not in our secret club. He can't be on our team. Rebuke him, Jesus. Jesus says, whoever's not against you is for you. Never be which, I mean, there's a couple lessons in that. Of course, you shouldn't believe that you personally have a monopoly on truth. There's only one person who has a monopoly on truth. God. Okay, don't believe you have it. It's God who has it. You need to follow God. You need to conform yourselves to God and Christ. And so we've got these people proclaiming Christ from evil motives. And, you know, Christ, the Christ is being preached. And Paul says, I'm going to rejoice in that. And that statement kind of rubs people the wrong way. It kind of rubs me the wrong way a little bit. You know, because usually when people preach the gospel out of wrong motives, or when people get things wrong at all, for that matter, we think that's a bad thing. You know, I don't like it. But Paul, Paul's thinking could possibly be along the lines, you know, well, people are at least being introduced to Christ, and they'll eventually grow to a point where they'll transcend whatever factions or issues are prevalent at this time. But there's a sense in which Paul's really just turning the tables on his enemies here saying, you're trying to cause me distress, it didn't work. It had the opposite effect. <laughs> He's saying, you're doing the work I would be doing if I was out of prison. You're just doing my work for me. And the result? Progress of the gospel. That doesn't mean that the truth is irrelevant. That doesn't mean it doesn't matter what one believes. It does mean that Christ needs to be given the central place he deserves. The proclamation of Christ needs to be central to our ideas about the progress of the gospel. And thirdly, look at the progress in prison. We'll look at how the imprisonment affected the Philippians. Paul not only rejoices because his imprisonment has led to everybody hearing about Christ and because even the enemies still manage to proclaim Christ and all their false motives, he also rejoices because of the Philippian prayers for his deliverance. Verses 18 and 19, Paul says, I will rejoice, for I know that this will turn out for my deliverance through your prayers and the provision of the Spirit of Jesus Christ. How can Paul say that? Does Paul know whether he's going to be released? Actually, he doesn't. And if you read the rest of the letter, it becomes clear. Paul doesn't know what's going to happen to him. He doesn't know if he's going to go free or die. And yet, he still says he will be delivered. What does he mean by deliverance? Well, you know, we're thinking about something greater, a greater deliverance in the resurrection of the dead. Suddenly things start to make sense. Paul says in verse 20, that this is the earnest expect is, I will be delivered according to the earnest expectation and hope that I will not be put to shame in anything, but that with all boldness Christ will even now, as always, be exalted in my body, whether by life or by death. Someday, Paul and all his enemies will all stand in the same place. They'll stand before the judgment seat of Christ. And when that day comes, Paul will be vindicated. He will be proven right. He will not be put to shame. That's his deliverance right there. That's what he's getting at in verse 20. And it will be true whether Paul lives or dies in, in, in prison. And, in, and Christ being exalted in his body, that will be true whether he lives or dies whether he lives or dies, he will see deliverance. How's that possible? Being delivered while one is dead. Well, this is Paul's great win-win situation here. To live is Christ. To die is gain. To live means serving Christ. And it is very much better. And it promotes the gospel's progress. To die means to be with Christ. More necessary. I swapped two things. This one should be on this side, that one should be on that side. Okay, so copy the chart in the opposite way. Um, yeah, very much better should be on this side, more necessary for your sake should be on that side. So to live, serving Christ, more necessary for your sakes, promotes the gospel's progress. Wow. To die means being with Christ, it's very much better, it realizes the gospel's consummation. Wow, I need to proofread these charts before I've met them up. It was so perfect. It was so perfect in my mind. <laughs> oh well. <laughs> and you know what? Even if I uh, make charts with poor design, at least Christ is proclaimed, right? I hope. Uh -huh. uh, Paul, <laughs> Paul isn't afraid of death. 
And you know why? Because he's realized the truth that so many Christians need to realize. Death isn't a defeat. It's a victory. No matter what happens, Paul has seen the way in which it is a positive benefit from the spiritual perspective. Having Christ means you can't lose. If Paul lives, it means he can continue serving Christ in this life. If Paul dies, it means he gets to go be with Christ and attain to the resurrection of the dead like he talks about later in chapter 3. And Paul says in verse 22, I don't know which to choose. It's just both so good. Hard pressed from both directions, he says in verse 23. You know what Paul's difficulty is right now? You know what his real dilemma is? It's not the fact that he's in prison. It's the fact he can't make up his mind whether it's better to go be with Christ or whether it's better to stay and keep serving him. That's the real dilemma. To die to be with the Lord and live forever or to go on living to serve the Lord. Living means fruitful labor, but dying means ultimate victory. Should he depart? Should he remain? Remaining would let him help the Philippians. And more necessary for their sake. But going would be good for Paul's. That's why in verses 25 and 26, Paul says, If I do remain, he's convinced of this, I know that I will remain and continue with you all for your progress and joy in the faith. Everything comes back to the progress of the gospel. Paul views the prospect of eternity right now as a huge potential blessing for himself. And he's prepared to leave what lies behind, to press forward to what lies ahead, as he says later in chapter 3. But the prospect of staying is an opportunity as well to work some more the gospel's progress, which was his initial source of joy in this text. How can Paul find joy in imprisonment? Because he had the right perspective. Because he saw life for what it was, and he saw death for what it was, and he didn't get caught up in all the distractions, you know? He figured out the true secret of contentment. The letter says in chapter 4 and verse 12, I know how to get along with humble means. I also know how to live in prosperity. In any and every circumstance, I have learned the secret of being filled and going hungry, both of having abundance and suffering need. I can do all things through him who strengthens me. What about us? Do we look to Christ as our source of contentment? Do we, do we relate to Paul's win-win dilemma here? We need to learn how. If we, don't know how to, if we can't relate to what Paul's saying here, we need to learn how to do that. To see life as service to Christ and death as gain to be with Christ. Is that a hard thing to do? Was it a hard thing for the Philippians? Let's talk about the Philippians. The remainder of the chapter. This paragraph here, verse 27, uh, bookended by this idea of seeing and hearing. Whether Paul comes and sees or remains absent and hears, he will know that they stand firm. The Philippians must experience what they saw and heard in Paul. That's an exhortation to unity here. Paul says, conduct yourselves in a manner worthy of the gospel of Christ, so that whether I come and see you or remain absent, I will hear of you that you are standing firm in one spirit, with one mind, striving together for the faith of the gospel. Now, I think that this is one of the most important passages about why local churches even exist. If we don't get this idea, this very basic idea about standing firm with one mind and one spirit, we're not going to get much else. It's basic. Conduct yourselves, he says. The Philippians need to use... I mean, it, can, can, is, it easy, is it easy to stand on your own? No. The Philippians need to use their common faith, their common goal, to stand firm with a common mind and a common spirit. We know what the end looks like. We know that Christ will return and vindicate us and give us eternal life. But on the road there, it's difficult to maintain this perspective, isn't it? It's difficult to remind ourselves of the fact that to live is, die, is Christ and to die is gain. It's difficult to have joy when the walls seem to be closing in. That's why we need this group right here. If we're going to help each other progress in the gospel... 
to start with encouragement for one another. You know what? The, the gospel doesn't progress when people attack each other or bite each other or devour each other. The gospel progresses when God's people genuinely have the same mind and goal. When they're able to put themselves unified behind the same purpose. The gospel of Jesus Christ. Churches don't grow when they're divided. That's a fact. Churches do not grow when they're divided. People come in, they can smell it. They can smell when people don't like each other, when they don't love one another the way they should. And why should they? A lack of love for one another? That's a violation of everything that Christ stood for. There's a reason Jesus said, by this all men will know that you are my disciples. You have love for one another. How can we proclaim the gospel of a selfless Christ and expect it to progress if we do not first exercise that same character of the selfless Christ? If we do not, as it says in chapter 2 and verse 4, not merely look out for our own personal interests, but also for the interests of others. That needs to be our perspective as a congregation. Otherwise, we're not doing what the text says. The mind that we ought to have, and you know, when it says stand firm with one mind and one spirit, when it talks about unity, we're not talking about the false unity that some people promote. You know, some people's idea of unity is you need to agree with me or else. That's not unity. Paul tells you not only that you need to have the same mind, but also which mind you need to have. In chapter 2 and verse 5, he says, have this mind in yourselves, which was also in Christ Jesus. The mind of Christ needs to be the thing we conform to. And if we do that, we will be unified. Then there really will be one mind. And if we are unified, verse 28, we will have no reason to be alarmed at our opponents. I just realized I haven't been putting points up. Seeing and hearing goals, the faith of the gospel, progress. It gives us defense against our opponents. Opponents. You know, it's kind of ambiguous here because we don't really know who Paul's talking about specifically. Um, you know, were there false teachers at Philippi? Were there people outside that were trying to persecute them? We don't know. He doesn't really say. Does it matter? The way we combat false teaching, stand firm with one mind. The way that we combat persecution, stand firm with one mind. The way we combat any opposition to the gospel and its progress, stand firm with one mind. That's the goal. If we don't have the progress of the gospel as our goal... We can't stand against the opponents. The mind of Christ needs to be our first line of defense against internal and external conflict alike. And Christ has given the Philippians a gift as well. Verse 29 and 30. It says, It has been granted for Christ's sake not only to believe in Him, but also to suffer for His sake. This is one of those few passages in the Bible that talks about faith being a gift. But suffering is also a gift. You know, you think about it. Faith is a gift, yes, but so is suffering. And just like you might think, the Philippians saw when Paul was beaten before their eyes in Acts chapter 16 by the Philippian authorities, they have an opportunity coming to endure the same thing. And when that happens, they're going to see Paul's conflict on a very personal level. And they're going to be hard-pressed as well to know which is better to choose. Life, death. Not hard-pressed to go, man, I, this is so miserable, I'd just rather die. But hard-pressed to choose which is better. Serving Christ alive or dying to be with Christ. Are they going to see that opportunity for what it is? Are they going to adopt Paul's creed that to live is Christ and to die is gain? And not only the Philippians, but let's read these last two verses in application to ourselves as well. That to you, you, the brethren at 14th Avenue, it has been granted for Christ's sake, not only to believe in Him, but also to suffer for His sake, experiencing the same conflict which you saw in me, that is Paul, and now here to be in me. To us it has been granted, do those things. Are we going to see that opportunity for what it is? Are we going to adopt Paul's creed? To live as Christ, to die as gain, 
we see that suffering, suffering not as something that is inflicted upon us, but something that is granted to us. Something that is a gift given to us by the Lord. A reason to give thanks, as the apostles did in Acts 5, that they were counted worthy to suffer shame for His name. Why were they counted, why did they count that as a joy? Because they saw it for what it was. Progress of the gospel. Take out your songbook. As we conclude this lesson this morning. Talking about preparing to meet our God. Well, Paul was prepared to meet his God. He wanted to die and go be with the Lord. But if he couldn't do that right now, well, then he had more preparation to do. More service in the Lord's work. More work for the progress of the gospel. And so it should be with us. Are we prepared to meet our God? Are we standing firm with one mind here even now? Are we prepared for the possibility of suffering, of rejection, of shame, of persecution, of death? Are we intent on accomplishing the progress of the gospel? And here's the real kicker. If, all those, if our answer to all those questions is yes, well, are we ready to do still more? As Paul prayed for the Philippians, that their love may abound still more and more. So our love ought to abound still more and more too. That's the thing about progress of the gospel. It's not quite done yet. He's begun a good work in us, but he must continue to perfect it until the day of Christ Jesus. If you're here this morning, you have not been living for the progress of the gospel, or perhaps you feel like you need to be re-energized, re-motivated to live for that progress, now is an appropriate time to make that be known. While together we stand and we sing the song selected.